Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Greetings and salutations. Ruben Bressler. Hey, how you doing? I'm well. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Hi. This should be an interesting uh, uh, experiment episode. Well, we're going back to the beginning. We're we're yeah. we're doing something we used to do in the past, and hopefully, it doesn't. You crash see, and burn. well, you see, there's normally a third party involved in these episodes, which we send our list to them. They let us know if one of our picks is higher or the same as someone else's. Uh, person wasn't available, and you know the the entertainment train just don't stop for for anything. So we got to keep going, right. otherwise, we're going to lose patrons and fans and followers and all that other horrible things that happen. So. We still got to make our lists. They're still going to be fun, but we're probably going to run into each other a few times. Just kind of how it works. Yeah. So but. I'm I'm planning on presenting mine in a little bit, like because a lot of the times we'll do things like where we try to bury the lead and talk about the card. I'm planning on not doing that as much, just for the sake of brevity. Um, but uh, but because I because I think that we might have some overlap, but we don't know how much overlap. So who knows? Right? Could be a little. Could be a lot. I guess we're obviously going to find out. That said, we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call honorable mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most luxuriant and letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top ten board wipes. Ruben, the I think this might be the best name. That has ever won this this one came from uh, uh facebook so this is a, a real actual name it's kiriakos hoid bakaliao wow wow kiriakos is the winner who writes the card i would have had on my list is a card that has many features of other cards that were on your lists it destroys more than just creatures like a chroma's vengeance it has green in its color identity, like Azuri's Predation, can be triggered at instant speed like Oblivion Stone and Nev's Disc, and in, and in homage to Ruben, improves one's vocabulary like Yokel Hops. It was a menace back in the day. It can kill weenie creatures and leave your fatties and planeswalkers untouched. It's a staple in black-green commander decks. It has it had a good value to it until numerous reprints pushed it down until a few weeks ago into the $2 range. And in certain fantasy tropes is something the bad guy does as often as possible. I'm talking about pernicious deed. That is the board wipe you guys missed out and should have been somewhere on all of your lists for various reasons. P.S. Shame on the Golgari girl from a <laughs> card. From her list. This I love when you shame us for our choices. It's great. Look, that Golgari girl is a dredge queen. Thank All you right. very much. Fair, Deed is really good at cleaning out zombie tokens, so I don't know. <laughs> wow. I had to get my fan. Deed. Deed was uh, one of the cards that I had most success with when I was a very uh, you know, 14-year-old young Ruben playing on the, the JSS scene. Deed was a big part of why I was successful early in my competitive career. Um, and yeah, I, I love me a pernicious deed for sure. For those who yeah, don't historically, uh, Golgari really cementing itself as the color combination that can deal with anything. And it started with pernicious deed. And, you know, now we have casualties of war. You know, we have Gaze of Granite. We have Abrupt Decay. We have Assassin's Trophy. That really is Black Green's niche now. I mean, for those who don't know, Pernicious Deed showed up originally in Apocalypse. It was a green and black and a generic mana for a rare enchantment that says X generic mana sacrifice at colon. Destroy each artifact, creature, and enchantment with converted mana cost X or less. Now, they've often rumored they're going to make this again. It just hits Planeswalkers, which I think would be very exciting. Uh, they've talked about reprinting this period in a Ravnica set, but then they said they didn't want it to, they didn't want it to pull too much attention away from right. the fact that this is a really cool reprint versus like, look how cool Ravnica is. So I remember I heard that way back in the day with City of Guilds, they didn't want to bring it back for that reason. Sure. Uh, and lastly, I would say it's worth 4 to $5, no matter what yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah. even from Masters 25, Conspiracy. It has really fluctuated in price. There was a period of time where Apocalypse wasn't on Magic Online, and could it could only be achieved by a, a special promotional printing, and they were like 50 tickets for pernicious deeds. This was 10 years ago at this point, yeah. but it was uh, there was a period of time where it was weird. I mean, it was a mythic and Conspiracy? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's a it's a dope card. Yeah, it's just it's it's just weird to me that it's mythic. I never thought of it as a mythic worthy right. rare. 
um, you know, no harm, no foul or whatever. But anyway, so thanks uh, very much for that awesome comment. I'm not even going to try to say that name. Oh, come on. Not doing What's it. His name? Poid. Poid. Poid, you're awesome and you're great. And uh, contact Erin if she hasn't blocked you already. You're well on your way. <laughs> she now knows your name. So you have the, you know, the, bulls, the little red dots starting to get closer. <laughs> Bob Ross. Bam. Got him. <laughs> that would be awesome. I know. Well, I guess so. Thanks. I want to get to the point where I can do that with like Google. Vo- you know how they have like the little pill for Google where you can like make your appointments. Mm-hmm. I want to get to that point in the future. We're going to be like, Block so and so, and it's like blocking. Like where I don't even have to like right. manually do it. That is the dream. Just... <laughs> this is so sad. Siri blocked Esposito. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow, conspiracy originally came out in 2014. That was sure five did. five years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Set, yeah. more, more than five years ago. And thanks to CoolStuffInc.com for uh, sponsoring that giveaway. Of course, you can go Thank spend you. it whenever Absolutely. you like. Uh, we're going to move on here to our top 10 M20 cards. Um, car crash edition <laughs> where we're just, just everywhere that's right all oh, over so before great. we get started if you're watching this on the patreon or you're watching this just as it comes out we are giving away a box of course at 2020 live on the show tomorrow uh, on the june 10th edition 2019 of magic mics uh if you happen to be watching this within that period of time that, that small window, which basically is patrons, because the rest don't get it till Friday. It's well, fine. The point is, you missed out. Um, all right. So let's get started here with number 10. Uh, my number 10 is what I would describe as a really cool pipe dream. And Wizards made this pipe dream in a way that, like, it just gets you so excited. You feel like there's a puzzle that you can solve. And when you solve that puzzle and all the things kind of clink in place and there's just incredible like puzzle thing that you put together, Field of the Dead makes you a million zombies. Really? Really? It's like your number one, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> I guess we'll get there later. Field. <laughs> What's funny is that if that card was fl- flavored as like Field of the Wolves, it wouldn't be on her At list. All. At all. Like if it literally had the same text but made like Gifkin <laughs> tokens, right. it just wouldn't matter. But Field of the Dead is a rare for me. <laughs> this is gonna be awkward the whole show. <laughs> it's a rare the guilt that you have over stealing my card. Now I feel guilt now. Well, I did oh god. You know what did we didn't know about this not third party thing till later. Field of the Dead is a rare land. Enters the battlefield tapped, and I always forget that it enters the battlefield tapped, and it blows me up on arena every time. It taps for a colorless mana, an actual wingding. Whenever Field of the Dead or another land enters the battlefield under your control, you control seven or more lands with different names, can create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. So, of course, the living the dream is Scapeshift. And you Scapeshift a bunch of these, and it's zombie army time. Yeah, so uh, there's a young man out there named Yeoman5. Uh, he is uh, a brewer and a grinder. And right around the time that we were doing our arena preview stream, which I'm sure we'll talk about throughout the episode, he had posted a big decklist dump um, on Pacebin of over a dozen decks that he had built using 2020 cards. And one of the decks that he built was the Scape Ship deck regard, re- revolving around this card, uh, which was my number two, by the way. I don't know if I'm supposed to drop that now or what. But um, and, and so he's made so many zombies. He's made more zombies than I ever have. Like, he was on Twitter the other day, and he said the most he capped out at was 36. Wow. And I remember going through all of my dredge screenshots, because I was so ready to be like, oh, I've done more than that. I've never even made that many. So, like, he really is living the dream right now. He spent a lot of time tuning the deck. I don't know if he, like, started it, but I know that he's put a lot of time into it, and it's been great to see the deck kind of develop and evolve, and I would absolutely play it. It looks amazing. This is where... Go ahead. I've also seen a Gates deck uh, with Golos Tireless Pilgrim um, that is trying to, you know, circuitous route and various other things to get uh, a bunch of lands in play and can finish off a game with the field uh, as one of its win conditions. Wow. That sounds like super fun. This is one of those things where they give you a very short window. We have three months where Scape Shift and this exists. And Aaron, I think, I do think saying like, this is my number X that's further on the list is probably better than not, than trying yeah. to, trying to kind of lead yeah. into it again. In reverse, you know? There you go. Well, okay. sometimes you got to swatch, you know, swap it up to keep it interesting. <laughs> Am I right? Okay. You work out to help make sure that stuff happens. All right. Right. Ruben, what's your number 10? 
Uh, my number 10 is Icon of Ancestry, mm. uh, in case anybody wants to jump on the Icon train. Uh, it's a three colorless rare artifact. As it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type. Creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. It also has pay three colorless and tap. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from the ch of the chosen type from among them and put it into your hand and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Um, I really like this card. Uh, there are a couple of tribes that got a lot of love in this set that want to make use of this, primarily goblins really uh, benefits from Icon of Ancestry. Um, uh, I've seen a number of Goblins decks uh, utilizing the Icon. Vampires is trying it out, although there are a number of uh, Lords already, and that is also surprisingly a deck that's a lot lower to the ground. Uh, and I've seen it with Merfolk as well. Um, being able to not only be a Lord effect, but also be able to recoup card advantage and be a Mana Sink is a... Is I got wrecked by a goblin deck during the arena stream, and I was I was happy to see it. Like it was really sweet to watch it do its thing. I was really impressed with the icon, and you know I think it's just a neat way of giving card advantage of a sort to these sort of tribal strategies that are typically known for being very linear. Just sort of get them on the board, turn them sideways, maybe make them bigger, and that's about it. And this adds a nice little dimension to them, and I think it's great. I think this is well. This is my number five. Hmm. Um, I can answer because I think this card is insane. I think I think Ruben, you're kind of like bound to your, like your rules and things that pushes a card like this down because this thing is st stupid. This is a glorious anthem for any creature type you want, and it also lets you go find more of those creatures all on the same card. Sure, they never used to give you all the pieces all on the yeah. same card. It was like, well, yeah. one part of the tribe would do that, look for more of them, you know, and this would give you your glorious anthem effect. You know, you should be happy that that's what they're giving you. Like this thing right. is nuts. This is going to be a ridiculous casual card, the perfect type of card to be twenty dollars, you know, in a few years because yep. it's a uh, uh, what's the five man enchantment, the one the goblins run. Uh, or the five man artifact, the uh, coat of arms. Coat of arms. Thank you very much. Exactly like coat of arms. Oh, yeah. Obelisk of Erd even has jumped in sure. price a little bit. A convoke. Obelisk of Erd. Yeah. Adaptive automaton. Even uh -huh. brass herald is worth something. Um, you know, there there's so many examples of this. You know, when it comes into choose a creature type kind of deal. Even things like Urza's incubator, which only oh reduces yeah. Cost. Um, you know, this is exactly, you're exactly right. Artifacts that do all of this stuff together for one tribe or, or another. Right. right. It's literally the ultimate glorious anthem for or any, you know, creature type. It's sort of like the, almost a generic Lord for God's sake, yeah. which yeah. finds more parts of its tribe. Like it's fantastic. Uh, Aaron, what's your number 10? So my number 10 is a card that I picked solely for the art. So this is an artist that has had a really big year, uh, maybe even past two years. And to be honest, I was getting a little exhausted. I, I felt like I there had just been this, this stream of, there had been you know, Kickstarters that had been successful and there have been play mats and there have been, there have been art pieces and there have been cards. And I was just ex exhausted. I needed a little bit of a break. Um, and then this card came out and I couldn't breathe. I got so much light from this card. Um, if this is a print, I'm in. I've already made it the, the wallpaper for my computer currently. Um, it even has a spot in my Zancha EDH deck. Uh, my number 10 is Unholy Indenture. Um, so Unholy Indenture is two colorless and a black. It's an enchantment aura, enchant creature. When enchanted creature dies, return that card to the battlefield under your control with a plus one plus one counter on it. And so my Zancha deck um, is all about uh, just lots of board wipes and making sure that Zancha is the only creature on the battlefield so that people are free to you know use her and abuse her um and so having these sort of black insurance cards is where i kind of like to be but this art like just when i couldn't just when i needed a break from seb mckinnon he goes and drops this on us what exactly is happening here so you have this 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 being and i can't tell if he's falling backwards into the murk or being pushed out of the murk but you see like a skeletal leg and then like there's goop and then there's like a sunlight and it's gorgeous and there's so many layers to this he keeps going back to these sort of faceless bald creatures that we've seen in a lot of his previous art pieces before like dirge of dread every time i look at this i feel like other things just pop out at me and it's so beautiful and gross like i feel like i can feel that muck on my skin and i just can't say enough about this card it's gorgeous and god help me if it's on any sort of merchandise because i'm in i mean that water line I love yes. that waterline. Yeah. So sick. It's beautiful and gross and just oh that murky, yeah. the, the the film kind of yes. you know goopy stuff falling off. Oh. It's sick. 
Seb McKinnon is the new hotness and, you know, well-deserved. I take back everything I said, Seb. <laughs> wow. Well, you have to keep reinventing yourself to stay new and relevant. And, I think that's uh, what it was. Like, I don't think it was being, and not to be shady, I think it was just that I felt like I had got, and I think we all had gotten to a point where, like, Seb had just kind of become, you could look at a card and know he did it. You know sure. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a Seb card. That's a Seb card. But I, I, I got too familiar, and this just completely threw a curveball at me where I was like, holy <laughs> so good. Nice. So good. All right. The wig. It's just... Let's move on here to number nine. Uh, my number nine is part of one of my favorite new decks. It is uh, the Favorable Winds is going to be in the format for another three months. And alongside it is the new Empyrean Eagle. Ooh. Empyrean Eagle is a white, a blue, and a generic mana for a 2-3 uncommon bird spirit with flying. And other creatures you control with flying get plus one, plus one. There are tons of flying payoffs, and there is a card draw spell that's divination, but it's only two mana if you have a creature with flying, uh, whispering words or something like that. And it's absolutely fantastic. This is a really fun deck. It's not the most competitive in the world, but obviously as it kind of steamrolls with so many uh, plus one, plus one effects and anthem on anthem on anthem, it doesn't. you don't have to do a whole lot to kill them very, very fast. And this card is sweet. Right. One of the first things that you can look for when the core sets are overlapping during that three month period is the things that Wizards only wants to give you three months worth of, which we've referenced a little bit uh, already. And this time around, we get the overlap of the two different cards, which are the, the Lords mm -hmm. uh, for flying creatures of any type, not just spirits not just birds not just angels whatever right. uh in addition you also get as you mentioned winged words uh to go along with all of those flyers to recoup your card advantage um they also gave you things like fairy miscreant and some other cheap flyers that provide their own card advantage which those blue white flyers decks really need uh in order to be successful um so yeah i think that the eagle has a chance to uh, to do some good good damage in, in standard when elite guard mage is a three four Oh, 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 it's so sick when this, it, when those numbers are different, it's just a whole different feeling of, I gained three life. I have a three, four flyer. I drew a card. Yeah. Go like it's, it's quite sweet. Um, that said, Ruben, what's your number nine? My number nine is a card that I have no shame in main decking a copy of, even though it references specific, uh, colors. Uh, but I also think that it might be the most important of the color hoser sideboard options. Uh, my number nine is Fry. Nice. Fry is a colorless and a red instant uncommon. It can't be countered, and it deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker that's white or blue. It might as well just say Teferi. Like, take him right. next time. Yeah. Both of the Teferis immediately tick up to five. Uh, it also handles a Narset that hasn't ticked down. Uh, it's able to handle pretty much anything uh, in, in those... Uh, Esper decks short of like a Liliana, which is sort of uh, losing in popularity. And oh, by the way, it also takes care of a Baneslayer Angel or a Shalai. A Lyra. Or, sorry? A Lyra? So, yeah, that's what I meant by Baneslayer Angel. <laughs> um, uh, uh, or any number of those types of creatures as well. I mean, this is that kind of super sweet. Red is going to get it done, going to kill your Planeswalker, kill your creature. No matter what happens, it has to die. Right. That's terrific. It also takes care of a, of a niv mizzet um, for a cheap cost, uh, which is which is a pretty difficult thing for a lot of decks, uh, red decks, to be able to do. Uh, some Usually they have to string together two kill spells, which draws two cards with niv mizzet. Uh, this is able to just kill it in one swing. It's I, just funny, too. Like, it's one of those, it's funny, and it's one of those terms that you, you're surprised. Like, how have we gotten this far in Magic and there hasn't been a card called Fry? Like, right. I mean, Wizard is is very particular on what single word use cards, you know, yeah. get. And uh, Fry is a really sweet one. And uh, this spell can't be countered is one of my favorite phrases. Aaron, what's number nine? My number nine is a card that I highly doubt is going to see any standard play, but I could be surprised. Um, I think it's crying out to be played within Commander. Um, I can't tell if I want this to be a Commander or if I plan on slotting it into my Moldrotha deck. Uh, my number nine is Yarrock the Desecrated. 
Um, so Yarok is two colorless, a black, a green, and a blue. Legendary creature, elemental horror. Uh, three power and five toughness with death touch and lifelink. Um, if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control the trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So it has a sort of panharmonicon type effect to it. I love the flavor of this. Um, if you read the flavor text, it mentions Balagid, which is usually a sign of Zendikar. Um, and so basically it was an elemental that got Eldrazi eyes or like got caught up in Ulamog's kind of, you know, cavity, stuff like that white kind of lattice, if you will. Um, and so the art is terribly, it, terrible in a good way done by Darken. Um, but I just love this. Um, I want to put it in my Muldrotha deck because Muldrotha is constantly bringing things back from the graveyard that are permanents. Um, and so getting, you know, double eternal witness triggers, getting, um, you know, double... Uh, you know, executioner triggers, making people sacrifice things. There are so many fun things you can do with this card. Um, and I'm anxious to see you know, what people come up with. I mean, Panharmonicon on a stick is exciting, kind of no matter how you death slice it. And lifelink. Like, and this is Death Touch done right. This isn't like a Grave Titan thing where they gave Death Touch to a 6-6. Six, six. It's like, this is how you want to give Death Touch. You want to give it to something with a little bit of power um, and then just make it, make that Death Touch really matter. And this is just great. Well, at the bottom there, you have the Lament, or, or Lament, rather, of Balak. Lament. Lament. Look, <laughs> three different ways. <laughs> three different ways I've got to say that word. Fantastic. Yerok grieves within the waste of Balaged's corrupted land, and later on Yerok's wave crasher. Yerok's waters rush and rage, where the enemies bled into the sand, where armies bled yes. into the sand. Yarok's fin lurker. Yarok's nightmares lurk and wait, where dark despair is near at hand. And lastly, on healer of the glade, grief and rage and nightmares fade, where hope and comfort make their stand. Mm, love it. Very nice. Very I cool. love those interconnected flavor texts. It, mm. It's 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 not it's a little reward for people who open lots of packs mm -hmm. and just start to dig into it. You're like, oh, that stanza two. Why would they have stanza two on something? And you go find out right. they have the other stanzas. That's really sweet. <laughs> All right. So those uh, those are our number nine picks. Let's go in here to number eight. Ruben, what's your number eight? Uh, my number eight uh, is a line of text that originally appeared on a spell that cost eight. Uh, but was later banned because in reality it cost two. So uh, the line of text being, look at the top seven cards of your library, put two of them in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order, is of course being on Dig for, Through Time, but instead it's on Drawn from Dreams. Yes. This card's dope. Drawn from Dreams, two colorless blue, blue. It's a sorcery, not an instant. It's a rare, and you look at the top seven and you put two of them in your hand and the rest on the bottom. Uh, huge, I mean, looking at the top seven is just an enormous number. Um, and being able to select the choices bits from seven is a huge deal. Uh, any way to put this in some sort of control deck, the, the, the being four mana at sorcery speed is going to hamper it a little bit. Um, it was already showcased, um, on our streams during the preview event in the uh, the Flood of Tears Excuse deck. Excuse me, it was called Flood My Basement. Sorry, in, nice. flood of, in the Flood My Basement deck, which we may talk about Flood of Tears of My Basement later in the top 10, who knows? Um, but it was uh, put to great effect there because when it costs zero, it's great. Because cost reduction is dangerous because Dig Through Time got banned. Yeah. Um, I just know that that effect is incredibly powerful. Games go super long. You get all these weird board states where both players have three planeswalkers that all have prison effects on them. And so having this sort of ability is a huge deal. Speaking of prison effects, um, this is a really nice card to have, particularly with Narset around, because you're not actually drawing the cards. Right. Um, you're looking at the top seven and then picking two. So a card like Narset that wouldn't normally allow you to draw more than one card per turn doesn't really work. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion around this card. You know, you mentioned, Ruben, sort of the drawbacks of sorcery speed um, and costing four. Um, but, you know, I remember when Dig Through, Through Time first came out, there were a lot of conversations about treasure cruise versus stick to time which is better yeah you can technically draw three random cards for one blue or you can pay maybe one blue more or more and get specifically what you need i really enjoyed seeing those discussions about what was better um because sometimes just drawing raw cards isn't what you want to be doing sometimes right. you know exactly what you need and being able to look at seven cards to get you there really helps it's a it's a lot of cards. Like mm -hmm. it's a whole basically a brand new hand. And note that you don't have to reveal those, or they don't have to be a certain oh. type. You know, they're just like, look, just look seven, get two, congratulations, you did it for four mana, you got yep. your dig through time. Not even at instant speed. Like I don't think this card would be safe at instant speed. 
no. at, at four mana. It's just too much. I also like the thought that they might be going back and like redoing certain cards again. I think yeah. that's really cool um, because, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that there's something to be said. We love these cards for a reason. And if there's a way to sort of do them over again, we're saying like the Mother of Runes or, you know, I know I, know I was kind of coming down on the reprints a little bit on Modern Horizons, but the ability to kind of go back and, and maybe right wrongs, I think is really cool. And I, I hope they keep doing that. I mean, it reminds me of, uh, there was, you know, when I made the, the magic show at the Pro Tours and I would ask them questions. And one of the questions I came up with, which I had the most fun with was they print Ancestral Recall, one blue, Instant target player draws three cards. In addition to that, you have to pay some amount of life. What is the number? Like, and Zvi which is like 19. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then later, yeah. yeah, and then later, Earn Foresight is like, I'm, this is just a, you know, I'm experiment, a thought experiment. It's just silly. And I'm not talking as official. Where's the go? It's probably seven or eight. And I'm yeah. just like, yeah, maybe, you know, it's, it's a great thought experiment of you're remaking these old cards, but they're way too busted. So how do right. you balance them? Well, for, for Dick Through Time, you make it cost two more mana and Sorcery Speed only. And yeah. it's still exciting. That's how good yeah. that card is. Aaron, what's number eight? So my number eight is a card that is very me. Um, this is a character that's been mentioned a lot in the flavor text. And, you know, I love I, I love a big obnoxious demon. You know, give me Grizzlebrand, give me Lord of the Pit. Like, I love that. And so this card is right up my alley. Um, I haven't quite found exactly what I'm going to do with this. Uh, shout out to my friend Tyler, um, who came up with a really cool... <laughs> who started working on a deck with this, and he called it What You Talking About, Villas. <laughs> My number eight is Vilas Broker of Blood, or Villas. Um, so Villas is the best. Um, so Villas is five colorless and three black. He's a legendary creature, a demon, eight, eight, which is eight, eight. Not the Grizzlebrand problem, 888, it all lines up. Uh, with flying, you can pay one black and pay two life. Target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. Whenever you lose life, draw that many cards. Do you know how many things in black involve losing life? Sign in blood, which is a great flavor win with this. Even just its own ability, the ability to sort of pick things off, um, you know, kind of hurt yourself a little bit and then benefit from that is huge. Uh, we talked about blue and the discussions about card advantage and whether or not you want to draw three random cards or pick specifically what you want. This is sort of black's deal of hurting itself to draw cards, getting card advantage that way. And I love this. And so I'm eager to see what people do with this. I don't know if it's worthy enough to be a general or whether it's meant to be um, a commander or whether it's meant to be a general. It could be a good reanimation target in standard. I don't know, but I love this. You know what else causes life loss? Hmm. Your opponent's creatures dealing you damage in yes! combat. You just draw cards when your opponent deals you damage with a 1-1. One, one. So good. That's amazing. What in the world? So you're just looking across the table. Heart me. <laughs> yeah. It's an 8-8, eight, eight, 8 mana in your number 8 slot. Is that correct? Yep. Very nice. Very we did it on, on purpose. Theme. On theme. Very nice. Well, this card I think is super sweet. It's definitely an option for standard uh, reanimator. If you want to do anything standard reanimator, you definitely look at this as one of the best fatties in the format. Uh, if you definitely don't want to play with dinosaurs and stuff, you know, I'd rather play with this guy anyway. It's far more exciting to me to kill things and draw cards than uh, like be indestructible or whatever. It's like, I don't care. I like drawing cards. Yeah. I also like playing with big, dumb idiots. And um, yeah. you always like the fatties. <laughs> Don't me like or Evan? <laughs> wow, Evan! Wow, that's, that's the that's the sign off to the magic show yep. with Ken Nagel. Yep, that was Ken Nagel saying, uh, "I always love the fatties at the very end of every yeah. show." Uh, after he I said mean, it, Aaron may think it, but do doesn't put it at the end of all of her videos. <laughs> that's true. But uh, th this card just it pushes the realm of what in the world is possible at what mana costs and what costs indeed for rotting Regisaur. Rotting Regisaur is a black and two generic mana for a 7-6 rare zombie dinosaur. That's right, he is. At the beginning of your upkeep, you discard a card. This is Aaron's number three. Wow. I sniped your number two and your number three? Ow. I'll remember this. Right. Usually it's it's brutal when we're like, oh man, I've got so many hires. Now it's now the, the rubber band is on the other claw. You want to have the... <laughs> <laughs> Look, Roddy Registrar, in and of itself, is a three mana seven six. I just, it's not even like two black and a generic mana. It is a black and two generic mana seven six. It is a giant 
monster idiot for the rate that you're getting is just completely ridiculous. And as we have all discussed, it's probably not that good. I have actually seen it in play. I've seen people work sure. with it. It's not unplayable. I just don't think that it's necessarily tier one, but yeah. you can't deny that those stats are like super sweet. So I played this during the arena preview event. Uh, I was playing one of Yeoman's decks called Rakdos Big Pig, um, yep. which is where you wanted to start off with this. And I'll have you know, I roared every single time I cast it. Go ahead and watch the video. I had a great time <laughs> with this card. Um, and so you're discarding the cards that you want to reanimate, um, and then you can bring back things from the graveyard. And so sometimes it's just the seven six. Where like I was able to kill people with this. Um, and if it, it's if I found it was getting to a point where it wasn't as effective, I might sacrifice it to something else or. I might do whatever and so this card was always fun even if it's not good it's just fun like i love the flavor text where it's as simple as you know now that's a zombie where it's like <laughs> you know it's just a big dumb zombie dinosaur i like to say that it's what happened what would happen if me and tappy had a baby mm -hmm. that cause this would be our baby um and so it's yeah. fun it was my number three i had a lot of good times with it I definitely agree that the, the place that this lives is when you turn that drawback into a positive. Right. Uh, I think that uh, Blood for Bones is definitely the Rod and Regisard uh, deck of choice going forward. We'll see if it takes off. Um, very powerful cards individually and when put together, they are uh, incredible. So we'll see if it, it goes from there. But it is a 7-6 for three mana. You can't sneeze at that. No. And Pacifism and fleet paralysis style effects typically don't see play in constructed formats. Right. So you can use that to your advantage where they may right. be bouncing this with Teferi. And, you know, sure. that's cool. But at that point, you didn't even have to discard a card yet if that's their response. Yeah. The biggest problem with this one is in standard at, with currently played decks are going to be things like Law Rune Enforcer. But everything <laughs> else. Phoenix. Yeah. Reek and Link Phoenix is going to be an issue. But beyond those, everything else that bounces, both to fairies, Callous Dismissal, those types of things, typically are sorcery speed effects. And plus, Bag of Holding works very well with a card sure. like this as your discard as well. Cards. And that's really sweet. So there's there's lots of options you can use uh, yeah. for this one. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our number seven. Ruben, what's your number seven? My number seven uh, is a land um, that I assume someone probably has higher on their list. It is Lotus Field. Um, Lotus Field is the, I think it's the rare that I'm most excited about personally mm -hmm. for how to figure out how to break it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, it is a land illustrated by John Avon that has the word Lotus in it. So like how many like cultural touchstones of magic can you put on one card and make it exciting? That, that, that's Lotus Field. It has hex proof. It enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice two lands. Tap at three mana of any one color. Um, I saw some interesting things done with this with the uncommon Kiora. Um, of course, this goes well with Brought Back, uh, among other things. I've seen some chatter about this in Modern with Amulet of Vigor as well, uh, to be able to immediately get the mana. Um, there, there are there's a Twiddle style Storm deck uh, in Modern as well that uses the Lotus Field. Um, and twiddle effects to be able to generate lots of mana rather than the traditional uh, uh, types of mana ramp. So uh, I, I'm definitely excited, and I think that this has a very high ceiling. Somebody shared a picture, I think it might have been Saffron Olive, of them playing on Arena, and somebody had this paired with Yarok, and the, the caption was like, I don't think they read what the cards do. Yeah. <laughs> because then they had to sacrifice more lands, and I was like, I am so sorry. <laughs> You pan harmonic on yourself. Yeah, what right. happened there? Uh, Lotus Veil vale is the card this is basically mimicking, uh, and Lotus Veil vale is on the reserve list. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, Lotus Veil vale is a little under twenty dollars, and this one's already over ten. So, right. yeah, casual players love this. Modern players want to break this. Standard players want to break this. Uh, it's got the word Lotus in it, which by itself people are going exactly. to love and collect and make sure that they, you know, try to get their copies of. So, uh, and of course, again, John Avon coming back for it from Weatherlight. Till today is, is kind of awesome, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm happy to see Wizards kind of get around the reserve list like this. Mm -hmm. Super happy to see that. Make me your weird, you know, just slightly alternate versions that still make sense. I love it. It's terrific. All right. Aaron, what's number seven? 
I love an alternate win condition. I love finding odd ways to win the game. Um, and the minute I saw this card, I knew that I wanted to do something dumb with it. I also have this weird issue when it comes to commander where I don't like to copy commanders of different color combinations. So for example, when Hapatra was my Golgari commander, I couldn't build another Golgari deck. I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And so I like to find commanders of different colors that I haven't quite built yet. Um, and one of them I don't have is a mono blue commander. And I think I might've solve that problem with my number seven. It is Atempsis All-Seeing. Um, so Atempsis is three colorless and three blue. It's a legendary creature sphinx, uh, four power and five toughness with flying. Um, you can pay two and a blue and tap it to draw two cards and then discard a card, which I, I love to do. Uh, but the most important part is whenever Atempsis deals damage to an opponent, you may reveal your hand. If cards with at least six different converted mana costs are revealed this way, that player loses the game. They've been very careful with wording it to not say that you win the game. We saw this with the new uh, Phyrexia Roar one, mm -hmm. where it, it didn't say that you won, it says they lose, and I really love that wording. A uh, friend of the show, Joe, played this at the pre-release and won games with this, and so um, I am not a deck builder, but if anybody's watching and you're brewing an Atemsis deck, send it to me because I can't wait. I just want to be like, whoop! <laughs> and just win the game. You can put a helm of the host and just get everybody. Like there's just so much you could do with this and I can't wait. There's there's like this this lovable fear. Like, you know, you're swinging in with your attempts and they're like, you got six cards, don't you? And you're like, mm-hmm. It's just so random. Like, and I love that. I love that it's a new take on sphinxes, sphinges, oranges, whatever you call it. It's um, and so I, I love this. Sphinges is the plural. Is it? Okay. Yeah. But I love it. It's a neat take on sphinx, sphinges, um, and it's a neat way to win the game, and I'm, I'm all about it. I'm all about sphinxes. Don't tell me not to... Why? why seriously. I never heard yokel hops until a week ago, and I'm like... It's Sphinx Jockle Hops, y'all. Sphinxes is acceptable because the common nomenclature allows for it. There we go. Very nice. Wow. Just dropping it. Ethereum Wrestler over here. Just top great. rope. All right. My number seven is uh, quite the angry boy. Uh, so angry that whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals two damage to it. Because Mar Marauding Raptor is here. Mm -hmm. And is ready to make dinosaurs sweet for three months. This is your period in time to be playing that dino deck right now. It's a red and generic mana for a 2-3 rare dinosaur. Creature spells you cast cost one generic mana less to cast. Just any of them. It doesn't even say dinosaurs. It just says any creatures, which is amazing. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals two damage to it. And if a dinosaur is dealt damage this way, Mirandi Raptor gets plus two plus zero oh until end of turn. And this card is ridiculous for the rate that you're paying for it and what it's doing and how it works with dinosaurs and how it works with Enrage. Like, where was this card when we were playing in Ixalan, right? Yeah. Probably would have been too much, I can imagine, playing for this for a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I mean, well, first of all, this with Raging Raptor is just absurd. Um, I mean, there's there's so many uh, combos available in standard right now with all of the enraged creatures. Being a 2-3 two, for 2 mana is huge. Uh, you're not going to want to play this in any deck that has any number of other creatures in it that aren't dinosaurs, I wouldn't think. No. Uh, also quite good with Raptor Hatchling, uh, which is, so turn 2 you play this, turn 3 you play your Hatchling, you immediately get a 3-3 three, three and you're attacking for 6 um, to wow. be able to get through so that's pretty good as well um i mean there's there's a number of interesting uh ways to take advantage of this card this is a card that um i saw it played you know uh, against me and i actually tried to build the dinosaur deck myself so i have all the tools available and here's what happens if this card is played if you get to play this card and they don't kill it then you are going to completely destroy your opponent. Like if you're playing Mar Marauding Raptor. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have Marauding Raptor, your deck is garbage. Like, you know, the failure duck showed up, splish splash, your deck is trash. Like, seriously, it's, it's, it's awful. It's, it's bad. And I love it. I love the card because, again, when you have Marauding Raptor, man, you are riding high. And when you're not, it's failure duck. Okay. I saw a couple of, of decks that were able to use Marauder and Raptor with non-dinosaur creatures. Mm. Uh, obviously, this is way better with them, but you could play your Thorn Lieutenants and your Gruel Spellbreakers alongside your Marauder and Raptors, and things are going to be okay for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just I think that this 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 card is another one that definitely has a high ceiling, and I'd be surprised if it doesn't see play. 
All right. Moving here to number six. Uh, my number six is probably higher on someone else's list. I'm guessing. I'm just going to run it it's, out there. It's going to be Aaron's number one. <laughs> I've already got her. how things are going. Uh, I don't think so, but Chandra Awakened Inferno. Oh, okay. <laughs> is my number six. Uh, it's my number two. So we're working on all of my top, all of our top. Oh, you're just a monster tonight. I know, right? Just the worst. Yeah. History's uh, greatest monster is what this is. See, I should have been over here going like, I got so many hires, I'm never going right. to speak. And instead, I just get to snipe, 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 snipe. Yep. This is terrific. Chandra, Awakened Inferno. It's two red and four generic mana for a six loyalty mythic legendary planeswalker that says this spell can't be countered. Plus two loyalty. Each opponent gets an emblem with, quote, at the beginning of your upkeep, this emblem deals one damage to you. And that is stupid, by the way. Mm -hmm. That is stupid. Minus three, she deals three damage to each non-elemental creature because those are Nissa's babies. We don't touch Nissa's babies. It's her Nissa, you know. And mm -hmm. minus X, she deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker. If a permanent dealt damage this way would die this turn, exile it instead. Uh, there is no doubt that it is a awesome planeswalker. It is sweet. It is cool. It is powerful. But much like Liliana was sweet and cool and powerful, I don't think this is going to see as much play as one of my later choices that we'll talk about when we get to her. Um, but Awakened Inferno is powerful. Going up to eight loyalty like is just stupid. It's oh. absolutely insane. I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but eight is the highest amount of loyalty that a Planeswalker gets to with a plus one, short of Karn or... Like Ugin or Nickel Bolas's. That's about right? right. I think so. Like for a six mana walker, this is the this is the ceiling. Everything else is seven and eight mana walkers that get that high that early. Oh, the spell can't um, be countered. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, it can't be countered. Immediately puts a, a clock that your opponent can't get rid of onto them, even if they take infinite turns. Um, it's it's crazy. It's a board wipe. It's targeted removal. It's clock. It does every. It dices. It dices. It does everything you could possibly want. I mean, they wanted to make Chandra the star, and certainly she is the star. And this is a terrific card. Uh, and I played against it, and it just feels really disparaging as a way to put it. You know, yeah. Like I had a board presence, but I can't deal eight damage in one turn, and you go up by two loyalty for God's sake. Oh. Also, the uh, the emblem's a nice spectacle enabler. Um, that was something I faced when I was at the, the, the early stream event, and somebody's like, whoop, spectacle, light up the stage. And I was like, yes! Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, she is the real deal. Um, but again, at six mana, it's a lot of mana. That's all I'm saying. It's a whole bunch of sure. mana. Six mana. Six mana is tough, but uh, if a six mana Planeswalker can get there, this is the one. All right, Ruben, watch number six. My number six, I had just previously referenced, it does combo very well with Lotus Field, uh, and I think it also has potential in modern. Uh, my number six is brought back. Really? Yes. White, white, instant. Choose up to two target permanent cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped. There are plenty of, uh, there's, there's plenty of history that we've had for things like Second Sunrise and Open the Vault and other white uh, effects that bring permanence back. Um, so in addition to merely being a, a, a Lotus kind of combo card with your, with your Lotus Fields, um, this I think could not only just do that, but also combo with, you know, your Cora Clan Ironworks style decks, uh, your Time Sieve kind of decks, anything that requires you to put permanence into your graveyard and try to recycle them. Uh, brought back could combo with them. Oh, by the way, it's also wrath protection. It's planner cleansing protection, any of that kind of stuff. So at the low, low cost of two white mana for an instant, I think that that is well worth it. All I ask is if anyone's going to play a deck with this card, I want you to call it brought back mountain. That's all. That's all I want. That's all I need. So, so that, that would point, require the deck to have mountains in it, I think. That's it. It needs to be a red, white deck. I'm not anti-mountain. Uh oh. I understand. No. Things have changed. <laughs> we can't call the deck brought back mountain and then bring back two forests. You know what I mean? <laughs> Is oh, you did. That would be incredibly ironic. Well, look, right. at that point, you know, you're trying to tell a story. You're confused. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, it's a whole, there's a narrative there. There's a sure. narrative. Wow. I, I just, wish I knew how to quit you. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, what's number six? So my number six was one of the first cards that was previewed for M20. And it was all right. I think it was exciting for a while, but then it, it just didn't hold a candle to 
uh, you know, similar cards. You know, Tudor is a very powerful, you know, popular effects, particularly in Commander. But, you know, when you're, when you've played with vampiric tutors and demonic tutors, this card doesn't quite do the same thing. But if you can find a way to break the symmetry, it can be a lot of fun. Uh, my number six is Scheming Symmetry. Uh, so Scheming Symmetry is one black, it's a sorcery, choose two target players. Each of them searches their library for a card and then shuffles their library and puts that card on top of it. Um, there are all sorts of ways to break the symmetry, if you will. Um, if you can find a way to draw the card before they do, if you can find a way to make them shuffle their deck, if you can just find get the card and kill them before it matters, that's another thing you could do. Um, I love the art of this, another Seb McKinnon hit here. This reminds me of playing cards and, and sort of the, the way that the cards are the two jacks or the two queens sort of diagonal from each other. I was playing this in Bolas the Citadel because you didn't want to hit a roadblock. Um, so you would play this for one life. You'd go looking for what you need. Um, you might find one of your explorer creatures that will help you kind of filter your deck, help you gain some life. And so um, you could just do your thing and then just hopefully kill them before they find that card that they look for. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this card. I haven't heard of anyone trying to break it yet, but um, I think there are neat things you can do with it, and I think it's cool. It's a $4 something card. I mean, okay. people seem to like it. They're yeah. able to tutor your library for one mana, and in multiplayer, this becomes political. Yeah, you know, this that is too. Yeah. I demonic tutor for for one mana, and you can demonic tutor as long as we're cool and you're not going to kill me anymore. Yeah, and there's also so many other ways to break the symmetry. You know, there's so many ways to make people shuffle or make the mill or something, and just make sure they don't get that card. Jace Unraveler of Mysteries, mill your two cards and draw your own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems sweet. All right, let's move over to our number five. My number five was already discussed. Icon of Ancestry. Ruben, what's your number five? Number five, I don't think is going to be on anybody else's list because I think this, the brought back, I thought might be a little surprising. I think that everyone is going to be surprised that I have Knight of the Ebon Legion this high on my list. Nope, because I got it at four. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Well, never mind then. Knight of the Ebon Legion is hot fire in, uh, uh, it's just absurd. So Knight of the Ebon Legion is a, is a black one, two. Vampire Knight, rare from M20, and doesn't have flavor text because it has so much text on it already for one mana. Pay two colorless and a black Knight of the Ebon Legion gets plus three, plus three, and gains death touch until the end of the turn. For those of you playing along at home, that's a four, five. At the beginning of your end step, if a player lost four or more life this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Knight of the Ebon Legion. This is just, it does, this does everything that you could possibly want in one card. It is um, insane. It's absolutely bananas. Uh, this also is uh, one of the is the choice one drop for the the um, Rakdos uh, aggro deck um, that took number one on the ladder most recently. Uh, the streamer Crokies uh, has really been tuning the Rakdos just aggro stuff deck. Doesn't even really try to do anything in particular. It's just Rakdos good rares, um, and uh, it, this is just a good rare all by itself. Knight of the Ebon Legion, man, it is hard for me to describe how this thing does friggin' everything. It kills anything. You can you can do that activated ability multiple times and give it plus three plus three again. You turn mm -hmm. to a four five, turn to a seven eight. Like you can keep going. That that minus you know that losing life thing. That's any player. That includes you. That means if you use your life on your spells or whatever, and you do it four more times or whatever, yeah, you, you get a free counter. It's yeah. ridiculous. This card's insane. You don't have to play any other creatures. You're just like I'm gonna play this guy. I'm gonna pump him up, and you're gonna have to do something about this one drop, and I'm gonna mm -hmm. play another one. It's crazy. This card is insane value. I love it. It's nuts. It's it's crazy. It's going to see play all over the place. It is an army. It's not like an army in a can. You know what I mean? No, it, it's, it's just it's just a single combat fighter. Yeah, it's like a superhero in a can. Like this card just like does everything you want it to do. Makes itself bigger. Makes itself scary. Pumps all your mana to it late game. Good turn one. Good turn ten. Oh my god! It's, it's more like a morphling than an arm than a siege gang commander. It's amazing. Seriously, Bizarre. crazy. Yeah. Aaron, watch number five. There are a couple of spells in Standard that allow you to reanimate creatures, but none, I feel, have the potential of this card. Uh, this was a card that I was surprised to see in a lot of deck lists going into the Early Access event. Um, I just figured it was a lot of mana and it was a lot of work and I didn't think anybody would be playing with it, but I was running it in my Rakdos Big Pig deck and little by little I found neat little synergies with this card 
to where I'm convinced it could have a home and standard. Um, my number five is Blood for Bones. Um, so Blood for Bones is three colorless and a black. It's another set of cannon. Jeez, set is busy. Um, it's a sorcery. Um, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature, return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then return another creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So if you sacrifice something with a death trigger, like say Rekindling Phoenix, you go ahead and get like your red cavalier back and then you can get your phoenix back you can get your citrus supplier back you can get a death trigger out whatever you sacrificed bring back a fatty and get the very thing you sacrificed back that is amazing um i was constantly finding neat fun things to do sacrifice that register that's not getting any use bring mm -hmm. back you know uh, bring back the pig ill hard ill hard attacks and then whoop the dinosaur is out again i mean there were so many dumb things you could do with this card um i was bringing back tetzel mox i was bringing back atollies um this is fun and and this is a card i think that is crying out for someone to use it and i think it's great it's fantastic because it doesn't have the t word you can't have target on yeah. these things and be able to get back the same thing you sacrificed so without the word target on it you can do all the things you want like they just kind of put the reins off of this thing and say just go mm -hmm. nuts crazy combos silly stuff it's four mana you know reanimate your hearts out yeah i think that this very likely has uh, uh it, the problem with this card is that it does need to be the center of its own archetype it doesn't fit neatly into other archetypes um but i definitely think that this has a a very high likelihood of doing exactly that uh that big pig deck that you were playing is one of the ideal homes for it being able to turn three registrar turn four blood for bones get back whatever you discarded preferably an ill hard and then return the registrar to your hand to be able to start swinging in for 13 starting the next turn uh is a huge deal super fun all right let's move on here to number four again knight of the ebon legion was mine ruben what's your number four my number four is a part of a cycle um we were a little bit down on the cavalier cycle when we first saw it but it seems as though it is a cycle of cards that uh, seem to be finding homes, and for my money, the one that is finding the home the fastest uh, is Cavalier of Thorns, which is the green one. I always like it when the green one gets the best in a cycle because nice. they, they don't always get the love. Cavalier of Thorns is two colorless, green, green, green for a 5-6 elemental knight with reach. It is a mythic. When it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top five cards of your library, put a land card from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. And when it dies, you may exile it. If you do, put another target card from your graveyard on top of your library. I've seen this used in a number of different places. Uh, it is an elemental, and so I've seen it as a five drop in the elemental deck. Um, more specifically, however, I've seen it in the Command of the Dreadhorde Sultai kind of mid-range strategies. Uh, being able to dig and get a land, fill up your graveyard for the Dreadhorde later. Not to mention, if it dies, it gets back your Tamiyo or your Dreadhorde or or something that you've milled uh, that you might need to enter. Uh, being a 5-6 is huge for 5 mana. It's able to tangle with charging monster sores and anything else that might come out. Having reach is a big deal as well, being able to stand in front of those big 5-5 five, five flyers that we've referenced earlier. Uh, and I just, I just really have been impressed with all of the varied homes that a 5-drop green creature with that many pips was able to find. Wow. I mean, uh, of, of the cycle, this appears to be like sort of the winner so far. Um, having lots of pips, I'm sure we're going to be at Theros before you know it. That'll be very important and, and interesting. Um, but as a five minute, five, six reach all by itself, and then it's going to do something neat when it dies. It kind of ramps you in some way, but really you just want yeah. it to mill you. Uh, the Cavaliers are so odd and it's, they're hard to both judge and appreciate, I think. Right. They're very strange. They do feel very, um, you know, these big, scary, but confusing elementals. It feels very high fantasy in that way, where you can't really grasp exactly the level of power that they have. Aaron, what's your number four? My number four is a card that I found to be super, super exciting. It was so exciting, I couldn't breathe. Um, I remember I was at work, and I was scrolling through Twitter, as I'm wont to do, and Wedge previewed this card. And I was scrolling and I saw it and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I did the gay gasp and I was like, <gasps> and I was like, oh my God, my. <laughs> I couldn't even verbalize my excitement for this card. Um, my number four is Kephas, the Hidden Hand. Um, so Kephas is Abzan Colors. He's a white, a black, and a green legendary creature elf advisor, kind of like Leobold a little bit. Uh, three power, four toughness, legendary spells, spells. 
enchantments. It's legendary enchantment, legendary artifacts. You cast costs one less to cast. You can exile two legendary cards from your graveyard until end of turn. Each legendary card in your graveyard gains. You may play this card from your graveyard. Uh, hi, Dark Depths. <laughs> Just all the dumb things you can do. I thought this card was good, and I was only thinking of creatures. I was thinking too small. I was thinking too narrow. But when I opened it up to all of the great things that enchantments can be, legendary lands, legendary artifacts, oh my god, like the sky is really the limit here. Go through gather and look up legendary. You can have a lot of fun with this card. This is definitely one I would be keeping my eye on. Like I said, I'm not a brewer, um, but I, I am definitely on the lookout for a sweet Pethys deck. Uh, yeah. You remember they made a whole cycle of legendary sorceries and <laughs> Dominaria? Sure did. Mm-hmm. I got mm-hmm. blown out by this card and those cards all together, and I was like, you could just... That oh, the, the And yeah, it was stupid. Just running Jaya's emulating whatever, and whatever the green one was. I can't even remember what that one was. Like, sure. it was... It was Kamal's nuts. Druidic Vow. There you go. That also fills up your graveyard for even more shenanigans. You can mm-hmm. even just play like a fair elves deck if you wanted to. Just like black, green, and maybe some white creatures. I don't know. Like throw in like Radiant Destiny or whatever the white. And then the you get to white. replay your Moxes. Yeah, I mean. And yeah, that's that's real fair. Also, mm-hmm. Mox Ambers going yeah. nuts. Like there, there's a lot of fun you're going to get to have until Dominaria leaves. And this is like, this is the Dominaria fun card. This is. Yeah. Go nuts with your legends, your legendary things, your legendary spells, your legendary enchantments, you know, sagas or whatever. Like, you know, go nuts. Yeah. Um, fan freaking tastic. All right. So that is our number four. So we're going here to our number three. Now, when I was talking earlier, uh, I was clearly talking about one version of a card. There was one Chandra. But I have played with both of those Chandras, and while the six Chandra, six mana Chandra is terrific and maybe just ends up being the better card, man, Chandra Acolyte of Flame is exactly where she needs to be to be absolutely amazing. Chandra Acolyte of Flame is two red and a generic mana for a four loyalty rare legendary planeswalker of Chandra. Zero colon, you put a loyalty counter on each red planeswalker you control, that includes her. Zero colon. Create two 1-1 one, one red elemental creature tokens, elemental being the most important word there. They gain haste, and you sacrifice them at, end of the, at the beginning of the next end step. And minus two, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with a converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard. If that card will be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. Lava Coil does exist. Shock still exists. Lightning Strike still exists. Yep. And that's a thing. Triumph, Jaya's Greeting, yep. all of which are hugely relevant. Right. So if you're not making elementals, you get to rebuy stuff. You can rebuy up to two spells. And if you've had her out for a while, if you play as another copy of her, she needs to keep going. There's an entire deck that we're going to get to over my next few picks as we talk about what I love so much about M20. Uh, but Chandra is, is just fantastic. She was way better than I imagined her being. And I love it. Yeah. She's great. All right, fine. No one else likes Sean. Fine, it's whatever. No, I do. I just, I just don't have anything to add. I think that, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I don't want to spoil the fun when it comes to why the various abilities are relevant. I think having multiple Chandras in play all at the same time with that first zero ability is super cool. And anytime there's a three mana planeswalker, uh, you have to sit up and pay attention. Absolutely. So, Ruben, watch number three. Speaking of three mana planeswalkers that sit up and make you pay attention. Ooh, hey, oh. We did it. My number three is also a three uh, mana planeswalker. It was actually uh, one of yours, uh, Evan, or a cool stuff inks, I should say. Mm-hmm. And that is Thorin Imperious Bloodlord. Ooh. Thorin is two colorless and a black. Legendary planeswalker Thorin. He is a mythic. He has four loyalty. Plus one target creature you control gains death touch and lifelink until the end of the turn. If it's a vampire, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Another plus one, you may sacrifice a vampire. When you do, Soren Imperious Bloodlord deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. Minus three, you may put a vampire creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. Uh, all of those abilities are hugely relevant. Um, being a three mana planeswalker that is able to gain you life is a huge deal. Having two abilities that do it in two different ways uh, is also a huge deal, particularly with how popular aggro decks and specifically mono red still are. Uh, I've seen a number of uh, strategies uh, that have just, you know, used it as a three drop and put a counter on it. But I also like dropping a champion of Dusk or dropping a Sanctum Seeker or dropping a Bona Butcher of Magan uh, a couple of turns early. Hugely, hugely relevant with the minus three. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw Caleb Durward's um, uh, Soren deck. 
but he was playing Soren on turn three, minus it, put a Morphodron into play, naming Slivers, and then putting uh, the first Sliver and Sliver Legion and uh, and and other giant Slivers up. Wow. So that was hilarious. Wow. And, um, and I don't know. I don't think I don't know if that deck has legs. But it was certainly there's something to be said when you can show and tell a vampire uh, and keep all of that mana for the low low cost. Of yeah, this this uh, this has that you know it's both unique to a vampire deck, but you're gonna have a lot of fun with it when you kind of you know go into crazy older formats and just like creature types don't really mean as much. I guess is a way to put it. Um, you know, Soren himself, uh, like that plus one, that first plus one, like, you know, don't discount the fact that you make something lifelink and death touch and make it bigger if it's a vampire. I mean, that matters when we're talking about Knight of the Ebon Legion getting turned into a two, three by default that you can pump into Absolutely. a five, six. Like, ugh, it I gets think also forgetting the most important part. Soren got out of the wall before we know what an MPL is. Hey, oh, you're well, not wrong. As of <laughs> July 9th, 2019, I cannot define for you. <laughs> but what, he's out the wall. But he's out the wall, y'all. Let me tell you. So, Aaron, we already knew your number three was Rotting Regisaur, which is in some ways unfortunate. You know what my number two is, huh? We know what you know. In fact, I know what both of your all's number two is in Field of the Dead and Chandra Awaken Inferno. And my number two, I'm guessing may very well be Ruben's number one. I don't know. Maybe. Possibly. But I do know that it brings me endless joy that Jim Davis wrote on CoolStuffInc.com that he thought this card was bad, that this card was nothing but an overpriced hill giant, that this card wasn't going to be able to do anything that you wanted it to do, and I get to play with this card, and it is, it is in fact a hug from Jesus, y'all. Because Omnath, Locus of the Royal, is my number two choice. It is absolutely terrific it's a red a blue a green and a generic mana for a 3-3 mythic legendary elemental when it enters the battlefield it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control you put a plus one plus one counter on target elemental you control if you control eight or more lands draw a card that is insane i just want to tell you that between the synergy and the and what elementals are doing in this set Wizards has not been, in my opinion, so overtly building your deck for you in a <laughs> single set since, like, the days of Mirrodin, for God's sake. Like, the yeah. days of Onslaught, when they're like, here's your Goblin's deck. You see how everything goes in it? Here's your Zombie's deck. Here's all the Zombies in it. Put them right in there. Omnath leads the charge, and this card is just completely nuts. It's, it goes over the top with the with the card draw ability. The, you play the land, oh, you have eight or more, you draw a free card, you don't have to yeah. pay nothing, you just get it? That's ridiculous? Yeah. And that type of fuel just cannot be slowed down once it gets going. Like, once you're at eight lands, man, the train just goes off the tracks. Willie, Willie Edel was gushing about this, which is weird if you know Willie, because he's sort of the godfather of John, you know, kind of black-green strategies, but Willie was saying that this could very well be the first standard viable Omnath, and like, yeah, I've heard, I think Elementals is the the deck that I've seen the most talk about since mm -hmm. 2020 came out, since we first got a taste of the cards, and um, I'm really excited. I mean, it is it is the deck du jour, as it were, but again, because this deck came from M20. This is yeah. ev almost every card that you talk about in the Elementals deck is from M20. That's awesome. Yeah, which is terrific in terms of, I love it, I'm enjoying it, mm -hmm. you know, which is great, but, uh, but wow, this card was unbelievable. And uh, that said, we're moving here to our number one. Ruben, what's your number one? Evan, I think we probably, we might share a number I one. I bet we do. I bet we do. Because what? I just I heard you espousing the joys of the elementals. Mm -hmm. And Omnath is neat. All right, whatever. <laughs> but Don't do whatever me with your Omnath, brah. Omnath's great. Omnath's cool. Um, no, she didn't. Not um, that's not the headliner, right? The headliner is a creature that instead of having a gold um, rarity symbol or an orange rarity symbol, instead has an uncommon rarity symbol, silver. In fact, it is an uncommon that is more expensive currently price-wise online than all five of the temples. Wow. Which wow. is a 
quite a thing to say. Yeah. You are an uncommon currently being opened in packs just after released. Uh, you can find copies of this card for around the same cost as Graph Digger's Cage. Who? And, and I don't know her. Ceratops. Other cards that are very likely to have impact on standard. Um, it is the reason, it's the glue that holds everything together. It is Risen Reef. Yes. Do we share number one? We sure do. Wow. I'm just glad you don't have my number one. <laughs> there you go. Risen Reef is a colorless, a green, and a blue, one, one, uncommon creature elemental. When Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it is a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you do not put that card onto the battlefield, put it into your hand. Evan, the floor is yours. Mother of God, this card is insane. They made the best card in the set uncommon. Like, <laughs> like you know, I was just like, whatever, I'm going to put all the elementals in the deck. Doesn't this sound fun? Blah, blah, blah. We're playing M20 in the preview event. And I swear to God, Risen Reef into Omnath, I, 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 like, I, it was an out-of-body experience. It was just like, I do what? And I, then I reveal and I put the thing and I draw the cards. And then I, I put the counter on the stuff and I get the thing. I just... Whoa. Like and to think I was only excited about this card because of the flavor text. <laughs> right. I thought the flavor text was brilliant. I had no idea it was good. Oh my God. Like there's a reason this is a one, one, but the fact that it's a one, one, just give it even more synergy with other rares that bring it back from the graveyard, which is it just that everything people are starting to throw this thing in like Bant Nexus. People are just yes. like, this is just like the ultimate coiling Oracle, the best coiling Oracle ever. Not close, not even halfway between Omnath killing anything in its way, between you being able to put counters on it. So when you get hit by like burn spells and stuff, oh my God, the fact that it's revealing all these cards, you can play for cheap because you have all these cheap elementals. Ooh, this card is nuts. It's just, and they're starting to see modern play that new, the new little revel arc, the tiny revel arc. We'll get the back this card. Arc, yeah. Yeah, ha, ha, woo, woo. and it's just, that's also an elemental. Woo. I was like, ah. I was, I just, there's so much goodness in this card. Yeah, yeah. I can't, there's just so many ways to slice how insane this card is. The fact it has the Titan-esque, it gets it itself, and it triggers every other one. Woo. Man, yep. Risen Reef is the real deal. My God. Thanks, Wizards. Seriously, this is a really great card. <laughs> Yeah. I've had more fun playing with Risen Reef. Than I, played in a I would while. also like it if Standard was dominated by a a one one for three mana. Like that makes me happy. That makes me happy too. That said, Aaron, because it's like it's like value is like it's been a while since a value deck has been the thing, right? Well, the last time a, a green blue three mana draw card, you know, guy hit the scene, they banned him. So well, true. Yeah, it's kind of busted, but this card's amazing though. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Aaron, what's your number one? I think it says a lot about us when you guys are excited about a 1-1 one -one and making creatures. Because <laughs> my number one ain't got nothing to do with all that. I'm not going to creatures. I'm not going to cast them. I'm not going to pay for things. Are you serious? No. Um, so one of the things I love the most about doing these early access events that we've been so fortunate enough to be invited to multiple times is that it never goes the way I think it's going to. And I mean that in a good way. So I always try really hard to pick a good three or four decks that I'm going to enjoy. And I and they're not good. You know, I go into these things with no expectations. There's no prizes on the line when you do this. You're just there to have fun. And there's always one deck that I assume is going to be the one that I'm going to like the most. Because sometimes you play them and it doesn't work. And it happens, and, and, and it feels a little bad. But you always have that one deck where you're like, this is going to be the winner. This is the one that I'm going to have the most fun with. I'm going to kill the most people with this. And in the three or, three or four early access events we've been fortunate enough to do, it's never gone down like that. The last one we did, I won the most with an elves deck, which, what? <laughs> and the deck that I took to the last early access event for 2020 was a deck that I had no illusions of doing well with. And I ended up winning the most with it and having the most fun with it. And it's all because of my number one, which is Flood of Tears. Um, so Flood of Tears is four colorless and two blue. It's a sorcery. Return all non-land permanents to their owner's hands. Mm -hmm. If you return four or more non-token permanents you control this way, you may put a permanent card on the battlefield. Hmm, what would I put on the battlefield? Do I want to put a Chandra on the battlefield? No. Do I want to put a Regisaur on the battlefield? No. How about a, how about a Risen Reef? Well, ETB trigger, that'll be fun. No, you put Omniscience on the battlefield and you live. You live. 
All your spells are free. <laughs> Drawn from dreams, free. Tamio's free. Nissa's free. You form yourself a little loop with Nissa and Tamio. You make all your lands big and you kill them. This card is amazing. Um, I lovingly call the deck Flood My Basement. It is taken off in our Discord. Uh, one of our one of our fans, Murmur, uh, one of our listeners, has been riding the deck into the ground since it first came out. Uh, they're running Jace with it now to where you can like just deck yourself and win the game that way. Um, this deck is just so much fun. This is probably another one of those three-month monstrosities, but um, I had the most fun playing with this deck, and if you would have told me that that was the case, I would have never believed you. The card brought me so much joy, and I love it. Wow. Yeah, this is a this is an homage to old school upheaval stuff, uh, where you're not returning everything, you're just returning the non-land. But you drawn from dreams and you get the exact two cards where you're like, what? Omni! Whoop! <laughs> filthy. That is filthy. <laughs> That's insane. This, this card's just kind of insane. They're kind of silly and like can can do crazy stuff. It's weird. <sighs> Wizards is like they give you certain things these days that they don't really didn't give you back in the day because they were so afraid of it. I mean, put anything from your hand on the battlefield, that's scary. <laughs> it's huge. And the fact that we get three months of it with Omniscience oh. is uh, is really fun. And we also have the critical mass of mana creatures right now yeah. mm -hmm. to be able to actually do it. So you can go turn one land or elf. Turn to another land of war elf and a uh, and a uh, uh, paradise druid or something or whatever. Yeah, and then you know turn three, you can play out some other permanent, and you're you're already there. All you have to do is live. That's all you have to do. If you can live to do this, it is so dumb, and it feels amazing. That's great. Well, I know what deck list I'm going to hunt down after we get done recording here. <laughs> flood your basement, Evan. Just flood it. That's right. All right. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So we made it through our top ten. We did. This wasn't as bad as I thought. Yeah, it seemed to go yeah. okay. It's all right, we did okay. Yeah, not not too shabby. But that's uh, that was our. I top. also noticed you guys are both wearing blue, and I'm wearing red. I'm wearing black. Is that black? Okay, okay. it's just like faded black. Oh. I'm, mine's blue though. <laughs> brings out brings out my eyes. That doesn't. <laughs> wow. Well. And that was our top 10 M20 cards. You'll see them on the screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. We'll move here to our final slide. So I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com. Uh, my co-host, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Russell, you guys for watching. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, treat, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, or Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow both the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast on Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes and Spotify. Or join us here next week as we begin Mike's and magic yes that will be very, very exciting. exciting uh the pod Happening. podcast is gonna be a little bit longer next week y'all just be prepared that said thanks for joining us here for all things goodness of magic mike's top tens good night everybody <laughs>